Uh, speaking of which, let's talk about CGI. You're putting on the CGI tournament. It's in, it's in about a week. Same weekend as ADCC. $3 million budget, two divisions, and two super fights. Winner of each division gets $1 million. Everyone gets $10,000. How do you even say that? Plus one. 10000 plus one, yeah. Plus one. Uh, just to compete. So it's August 16th and 17th. Everybody should get tickets. Same weekend as ADCC, so, which is August 17th. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's the mission of what you're doing there? The, uh, the mission has always been, first and foremost, increase athlete pay. So ADCC has invested a ton into the sport. Obviously, I mentioned Sheikh Tanun. Sheikh Tanun's done so much for the sport of grappling, particularly no-gi grappling. So he's growing it. He has funded this for a very, very long time. But we've kind of hit a point since 2017 where the audience, the crowd watching live and at home behind a paywall has grown considerably. We had things like Meta Morris, we had the Eddie Bravo Invitational, Polaris, all these sort of professional events that have also contributed to growing the sport. And obviously people like Gordon Ryan have definitely increased the popularity of the sport. But the payment for ADCC has never gone up, despite, again, the growth of it. So what I did, a lot of fans were asking me earlier in the year, they said, okay, you're gonna do ADCC. And I said, that is a big commitment of time, energy, expenses on steroids to get my body ready for a tournament that I'll probably lose. And if I lose on day one, I make $0. Mm -hmm. If I lose on, if I lose in the final, which I have done a couple times, I only get $6,000. I think third place is 3,000, fourth place is 1,000. So if you make day two, you get paid. But for me personally, seeing ADCC 2022, you're looking out to a sold out crowd of like 10,000 people. It's on Flow Grappling, which you know paid quite a bit of money for the streaming rights. I can't comment on what that number would be. And then you go home, despite having put in all that effort with only 6,000, and they basically, the argument is you're paid an exposure. But again, there's many ways to expose yourself. You know what I mean? That's just one of the platforms to do so. Yeah. My problem was that they announced that they were going to go from Thomas and Mac to T-Mobile, which is a jump in quality of stadium, but not a significant jump in sort of seating. So we've gone from like 11,000 seat arena to I think a 15, 16,000 seat arena. And I knew that Flow Grappling would have had to pay more money because now the sport's growing so much. And I can personally kind of track the growth of the sport through selling instructional DVDs, instructional online products because that keeps growing. And we're targeting those white and blue belts vulnerable to internet marketing. Yeah. And that audience continues to grow, and those will be the people that largely watch ADCC, events like this. So I simply said, in response to a lot of fans asking me, why are you gonna do ADCC? And I just simply made a video saying, no, probably not, probably not. It'd be nice to make some more money. And then I listed a bunch of sports such as Kokbar, that you get paid more to win Kokbar. In the villages of Kazakhstan, the payment structure is higher. Mm -hmm. And I received a very aggressive response, not from any of Sheikh Tanun's people, but from basically who runs the event today. One of those guys amongst giving me death threats said, hey, T-Mobile costs $2 million. You don't know what you're talking about in terms of business and production. And he's probably right. But to me, $2 million is a waste of money for a jiu-jitsu event, I don't think we're at that level yet. Like that's where the UFC host events, you know, $2 million, that's an expensive, expensive venue. So we argued a bit on the internet and he said, hey, if you don't like it, why don't you go get $2 million and put on your own tournament? And I said, I might just do that. Mm -hmm. And one of my uh, anonymous friends kindly donated a $3 million budget. And I actually messaged him before the show to say, hey, we won't reveal your identity, because obviously anyone that has money is going to get asked for more money for, or ask for money from others. So he wants to remain anonymous. But he basically just said to enjoy the trolling aspect of it and also contribute to the sport of jiu-jitsu. Well, it's good to know that the, the anonymous funder appreciates you for who you are, Craig Jones. He sees my true identity and he wants to provoke. It's, it's, it's trolling for a good cause. Yeah. 
But basically, we were able to find Thomas and Mac Event Center, which was their original venue, and it just so happened to be available that same weekend, which we're very happy about. So we booked that out. We decided to ADCC pays ten thousand to the winner. We were like, you know what? We'll pay ten thousand dollars plus one to show up. So to show up in our event, you're going to get paid more than to win ADCC. And not only that, we're going to broadcast it for free. So on Meta, X, and YouTube, you'll be able to watch this event for free. That's amazing. It's very considerate to the Flow Grappling streaming platform, I believe, to have also a free alternative on the same weekend. And the brilliance of this whole thing is I was largely criticized for not knowing anything about business, but the people criticizing me decided to host a tournament at 15,000 seat arena. They decided to take sponsors. They decided to use a streaming platform which sell subscriptions based on the athletes that would enter it, but not give any of the talent, the athletes, a contract, which gave me this beautiful position to basically say, hey, what do you prefer the prestige of an ADCC gold medal or money? And that's the fuse so far. And we put that we put that out into the world. I didn't chase too many athletes down. Obviously, a lot of these guys really need money. So you throw a million dollars out there, people are jumping on board. So initially, we started getting, we got two local guys here in Austin, the Tackett brothers, they jumped in first. And they're great kids. They really legitimized the whole thing because if, if we'd pick certain athletes like just B-team guys straight away, mm-hmm. it's already looking a bit dodgy. But we got some legitimate athletes, especially the under 80 kilo divisions full of Minus two or three guys, that's the best people in the world in that weight division. And as we started to grow our roster here, what happened, I'm going to say this allegedly for legal reasons, is that the first move ADCC did was they matched the female pay to the men's pay. So the women always traditionally got paid less, I think $6,000 for first place. As soon as we had Fionn Davies, the uh, reigning champion, come across to do a super fight with us, bang, ADCC raised the prize money of the women's division to equal the men's. So me being a feminist activist throughout many of my years on this earth, immediately got women's pay raised in the sport of jiu-jitsu, equalized basically, which went counter to everything the promoter had said because he said it was out of his control to raise money. He said only the only the ADCC, I guess, coming directly from the Sheik or the Sheik's sort of guys could raise the prize money. He got it raised. And then what happened was once we started getting some of these big names here, so some of the best guys from ADCC would be in this division. We've got a bunch of champions or medalists or really the top betting favorites for their divisions there. They started, again, I can't emphasize this enough, allegedly paying show money, which has never historically been done before, to keep athletes in their show. So you're saying, allegedly, there were some under-the-table payments by ADCC. Do you have secret documents proving this? <laughs> I do have the documents. No, okay. some of the guys obviously told me, you know how it is, you slap a million dollars on the table, it looks great. That was me proving I had the money, which yeah. wasn't even my money to begin with. But it was basically me saying, hey, the money's real. Not, I don't know why, but strangely, a lot of people don't believe me when I'm telling the truth. I don't know why they wouldn't. But what logically happens is they're like, Oh, look how much money he has. We're going to give, like, give us more show money. So they're negotiating with me. There was one particular Brazilian businessman, Mm -hmm. manager. I won't say his name, but he looks like the thing from Fantastic Four. And he was a manager for some of these athletes. And he would take a massive 20% cut. So what he, and I got to, I got to pay respect to this, uh, respect to this because it actually caused trauma to the other team as well. But he would, uh, I would invite an athlete to CJI. He would go to the other organization and he would say to them, hey, what sort of deal could you give me to keep this guy? You want to keep him in your event? And he would use CJI to leverage more show money for his guys, of which he gets to grease the wheels with 20% for himself. However, at CJI, everyone gets $10,001 across the board and a million dollars prize money. So there's no room for really negotiation for the tournament aspect of us. So he has a vested interest in putting his guys in ADCC because he can negotiate show money and he can basically take 20% of, of that for himself. But really, for the sport of grappling, this is incredible across the board because by us stealing or at least borrowing a bunch of athletes from ADCC, ADCC had to fill their divisions. 
So they filled their divisions with many other competitors that wouldn't have ordinarily had the chance to do ADCC. And really, although we've scheduled it the same weekend, ours is actually Friday, Saturday, ADCC being Saturday, Sunday, our day starts pretty late. So we start 5 p.m. Saturday. So really, ultimately, it was a big marketing ploy to go head to head, pretending like we're making the fans choose, but the fans will be able to watch both events. You'll be able to go all day Friday for us. You'll sadly miss the ADCC Hall of Fame ceremony where you'll see many of great speakers, public speakers, philosophers tell their stories about hardship. Just like at the end of any jiu-jitsu seminar or beginning, if you're blessed like that, you might have a 45-minute monologue Mm -hmm. about how they're more knowledgeable than doctors, lawyers, classic black belt technique, but you will miss that. With great metaphors about lions. and About lions, yes. About being a humble lion, most importantly. But Humility is important. You can watch all that Friday. You can watch most of ADCC Saturday. And then Saturday night in Las Vegas, I'll be doing what many men have done before, and that is wrestling a giant woman. <laughs> <laughs> can you speak to that? How are you preparing... Um, for this moment of violence on a Saturday night with Gabby Garcia. So Gabby Garcia is the legend of sort of women's grappling. I think she's won more than anyone else. So between me and her, we would at least have 15 to 20 world championships, I'd imagine. Yeah. She's huge. I say that in an endearing way. Mm -hmm. She might be six foot four, six foot three. And her weight varies depending on what time of the day it is between 220 and 275 pounds, but she's going to be coming in quite big and strong. Me, I am about 179 pounds right now and a five foot 11. So I've got a significant size disadvantage. She has the credentials, but we're going to, we're going to scrap it out, scrap it out and see who's best, the greatest woman's competitor of all time, or a guy that's never won anything. (laughs) Has it added some complexity to the picture that, you know, there's some sexual tension in the room whenever you, the two of you are together? Yeah. Or maybe I'm being romantic, but it seems like there's, you've slowly started to fall in love with each other. It's been three years of seduction. Yeah. It's been a long time. It's inspiring for for many young men that follow you <laughs> and look up to you. <laughs> Just the, 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 the romantic journey that you've been on. It's truly inspiring. Yeah, I would say it's a motivational message to the guy that keeps sending DMs to a girl on Instagram for years. That maybe after three years, it could also happen for you too. No matter <laughs> no matter her her height and weight, I think yeah, persistence is the key here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we do have a wager on the line. What's this the might, wager? This might be the first wager of its kind. I would hope in combat sports history, mm-hmm. if she wins, I'll personally give her a million dollars. If I can footlock her, we're going to collaborate together in an OnlyFans sex tape. Did she agree to this? She shook on it. <laughs> this is great. You do have an OnlyFans channel. Is that still up? <laughs> it's After oh. August 17th, it's going to be fire. <laughs> it's going to be on fire. Yeah. Wow. I think that, and honestly, when we talk about Secret Investor, I think that could fund the entire tournament. It'd be that yeah, that, that'll be the only paywalled thing about this tournament. This <laughs> is your only fan. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's going to be a spiritual yeah. experience for me. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm totally <laughs> distracted now. Can you talk about the rule set? So we're using the angled walls inspired by Karate Combat. Karate Combat do those angled walls. Those are awesome. You, you're calling it the alley. That's really, really interesting. So the it's like in a pit, I guess, and the angled yeah. walls are... Yeah, so Karate Combat have a, a square pit. We have a rectangular alley. We like the visual of just, you're in the alley with someone, you know, you come, we both know what goes on in the alley. There's yeah. only a couple of things that could go on back there. What's but, the second thing? Never mind. <laughs> I got it. But why this is brilliant Why the angled walls are brilliant for grappling is because any grappling tournament, this goes without question, goes for IBJJF, ADCC. The reset is one of the most annoying aspects of the sport and one of the aspects of the sport that these some of the sneakier guys take advantage of. There's guys out there that are brilliant at playing the edge, hoping the ref will reset them or they'll shoot a takedown near the edge. 
And you might watch, and again, I'm picking on ADCC here, but you might watch an ADCC match where 90 seconds of a 10-minute match is the referee grabbing them, bringing them back to the center, or trying to recreate something of a position that landed outside. Not only is that sort of boring to me, it and it sort of could be bias. You know, like, again, it's happened to me in events where, like, I've the ref's gone, stop, I've stopped, he's moved a little bit more, and then there's an adjustment in the reset. I mean, it's cheating to a certain extent. It's just more of an annoyance. They bring it back, they reset it to the best of their ability in the center. The angled wall mitigates that, and it mitigates it in such a way that is a disadvantage to be pushed up against the angled wall. You're very easily taken down against the angled wall. You could use a cage like the UFC does or any sort of MMA organization. However, cage wrestling can be slow. You're obviously at the vertical, and it can stagnate there. Guys are very good at using split squats to really defend that position. So we And for me personally, I don't love the cage for grappling. I'd like to differentiate it for grappling. What holds people back from using the alley or a pit-like structure is the viewing, the viewing angle. Because if obviously if you're one of the VIPs or you pay for expensive seat, that angled wall's above you. A cage you can see into an elevated platform sort of stage you can see clearly into because it's basically flat, but the athletes could fall off and injure themselves. So if something happens to UFC fire passes, the elevated flat stage, it's kind of scary to be near the edge. You you go you go off. You're going to land on concrete. You might want to do that to the other guy if you that way inclined. But the the alley, the angled wall, solves all those problems. Very minimal referee interference. Again, the only thing that holds people back is the expense of building it. But again, when you're spending someone else's money, you will spare no expense in production. So we've spent a lot of money on the alley, and we've really gone out of our way to create an experience that around the alley, we've elevated everything so that the people watching will be able to see down into it. Because at, at an, your instinctual thought is, oh, it sounds great, but how am I going to see in it unless I'm far up? Like you'd need like a Colosseum-like structure, which is basically what we've attempted to create so that you get both a perfect place to, to wrestle, to grapple in, as well as a perfect viewing angle for the fans. Well, I think it's an amazing idea. What about the jiu-jitsu on a slant you've triangled uh, yes. somebody on a slant is there like some interesting aspects about the actual detailed techniques of how to be effective using a slant i'll be honest i competed for karate combat twice never once did i ever step foot into the pit just again like you said before the podcast if there's a right way of doing things i'm probably doing them the opposite the wrong way i actually no idea why you people take advice from you but they do <laughs> I'm mostly an inspirational speaker at this point. I think. Yeah, you and Tony Robbins are like this. Same size at least, but in terms of the training for of, of obviously the athletes, it's very difficult. Some of these guys have gone out there and built their own angled walls. Yeah, I saw that. That was a cool video of that. They're getting into that. That's a smart thing to do. There's a million dollars on the line. You should probably invest in that. But I also like a new surface that no one's competed on. No one's gamed it yet. No one's like, we're going to see it unfold. Like, yeah. like when... UFC, when people started figuring out how to use the cage, we're going to see this unfold in front of our very eyes, how the strategies work for this. The other thing we've done too is we're doing rounds. So qualifying rounds would be three five-minute rounds. The final would be five fives. Why I want to do that is to incentivize action. We're going to incentivize action through penalizing people, but we really want – I love a short burst, a break, and the guys can go hard again. I don't like a jiu-jitsu match where the guy takes the back early and he's like, oh, if I keep this position, I've won. And that's something that people that don't compete don't realize. It's if you take some, if you get a good position early, get up on the points, you just sit there and go, oh, let's ride this to the end. That's why I want rounds so that you might take guys back. You really incentivize to get that finish. And the way we're trying to grow the sport is to steal the MMA scoring structure, which a lot of people criticize because they think it's overly complicated. They don't understand it. But to the mass audience, they understand a 10-point must, understand a decision in that sense, they understand it being scored round by round. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to appeal to a broader audience here. But we think based on the structure, based on how hard we'll call stalling penalties, 
based on you wanting to finish your opponent quick to have a better chance at a million dollars. Because it's 10,001 to show up and a million to win. If you ain't first, you're last. There's no reward for second place. So I'm punishing the one position I've only ever been able to achieve in tournaments. <laughs> Are you worried that uh, because of how much money is on the line, people will play careful? A very generous friend of mine has provided this money. I'm like, unless you guys go out there and try to kill each other and put it all on the line, I, I just won't do it again. Yeah. Like, I'm giving you guys a massive platform. We've turned down offers from streaming platforms that wanted to buy the rights to this event because the marketing's gone very well. We're turning down money to grow the sport. The ADCC promoter said he wanted to grow the sport. So what he did is he put it behind a paywall and he used the money from the paywall to buy a more expensive arena. I don't think that's how you grow the sport. I think you grow the sport like comedians do these days. Like guys like Mark Norman will release a special for free. Andrew Schultz did it first, released a special for free and it grew his audience massively. I think that's what jiu-jitsu needs. We need an exciting show that's not behind a paywall that'll grow the sport, grow the audience, and really, then, ultimately, we can get to a level where it could be behind a paywall. But I just don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I think a million dollars is a lot of money. But the, the opportunity here, because it's open and freely accessible by everyone, is to put on a show. And then you get a million every year. If, you, if this is a crazy, exciting event, the funding is going to be so easy year after year. And the other aspect we're doing to it is, unfortunately, I'm not going to make any money off this thing. It's a non-profit. And the money from charity except the only fans but whatever yeah that's the real cash cow <laughs> but that's the real work too yeah I've, and that's not for charity that's for your personal bank account the the only fans are you also that, oh that'll be for the follow-up therapy but yeah, the ther <laughs> that'll be an expensive gig for whoever takes that on board love hurts <laughs> that physically will yeah <laughs> ticket proceeds to charity so like obviously we've got the three million dollar budget we've got production expenses um We've got the team of staff to hire. Um, but if we could sell this thing out, we could potentially donate a ton of money to charity. One of those charities is Tap Cancer Out. And what's great about this is Rich Byrne is a black belt from New York who's in the banking world. He used to run an event called Kasai Grappling. He went through cancer. He basically had a very aggressive cancer. He had it treated. And now he basically has said to us that whatever we donate from the profits of the event, he's gonna match dollar for dollar. And we've also had another guy who wants to remain anonymous agree to match dollar for dollar as well. So the more ticket sales revenue we can create here, the more we can actually give back to charity. So it's really all round, it's gonna be a great event. Yeah, Tap Cancer Hour is great and all the charities that the athletes have been selecting are great. Uh, what's been the hardest? <laughs> you, uh, you are wearing a suit, so you figured out how to do that. But the tie you, was difficult for the sure. The tie was difficult, but you figured it out, and <laughs> congratulations on that. But you've never run a tournament. No, <laughs> I've never wrestled a big woman either. Well, I have, but not in this form. Not a, in a competitive environment for OnlyFans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's been the hardest the aspects of actually bringing this to life? The first one was people believing it was real. Yeah. That was quite difficult. And then communicating with the athletes. That's basically been my responsibility is securing these guys, getting these guys to commit to things. They're very, it's very difficult. For, there's a reason a few athletes in every sport really stand out. And it's kind of professionalism and kind of the way they market themselves. And I think those two things do go hand in hand. So we're in a sport where there's not enough money where a lot of these guys do have managers. I think in MMA, things would be a lot easier for the promoter because you're not talking directly to the athlete. You're talking to a guy who, who might, who's obviously taken a cut, but like he's, there's a middleman. Mm -hmm. So in a situation where you're talking directly to the athlete, it can be very difficult, can be very annoying, can be very hard to reach these guys. Can, they can be very non-committal. That for me has been one of the biggest challenges. The guys that I speak to that are like, I'm in. And then they're like, I'm out. I'm in, like navigating this area. One other aspect is because we did this basically from idea to event will be less than three months, three and a half months. So it's like we're having to do so much in such a short period of time. Little things like of the show money we've given them, 
they're expected to basically secure their own flight and hotel to the event. We're cutting down on staff because that would be one of the, if I had to coordinate getting <laughs> these guys flights, I would just jump off a building. Like it's, it's hard enough to get them to agree to the event, let alone coordinate. Hey, what date do you want to come in? It's like herding cats. So really just the interpersonal stuff's been difficult. Obviously going up against ADCC, the legacy of M has been pretty damn difficult as well. Well established, huge history. They've been selling tickets for two years. Everyone's known it's been coming for two years. That thing was largely sold out before we even announced the event. So we're going head to head with this event. So from a ticket sales perspective, very difficult. What's been a uh, Reddit question? What's been the most surprising people who turned down your invite? Ooh, I mean, we can, uh, we can name names. I mean, obviously, Kainan, he was a semi in, semi out. His suggestion was actually to do a second and third place prize mm -hmm. rather than a million. And I'm like, no, we want a, all or nothing. It's all or nothing here. Mm -hmm. well, that's a better spectacle, better entertainment. Yeah. Probably more injuries, but it's all or nothing. Miki Galvao, the one that got away. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. But we got the Rotolos. The Rotolos, props to these kids because Cade's the reigning champion. Yeah. These are two of the best guys in the sport allegedly were offered pretty significant show money to stay. But they hit me up and they said, hey, promise us one thing. We're on opposite sides of the brackets and we'll fight to the death in the final for the million. And we know, everyone knows that. We've seen them compete against each other multiple times. So that was not a surprise because I know they're good kids, but to basically turn down allegedly show money to do this event, to support the event, to me, is incredible. Mika Galvao, things would be more complicated there. Like, obviously, Mika officially joined ADCC before he secured the Rotolos. Cade beat him in the final. Mika's personally motivated to face off against Cade. So he didn't know Cade was in our event before he agreed to ADCC. Mm -hmm. There's more to that story, too, in terms of Mika doing ADCC because a bunch of the kids in his team, I think they're being flown out to do the ADCC kids event. So there's like his two teammates, well, at least one of his teammates will be doing the ADCC 66 kilo division. So his, co his dad, his coach doesn't really want to split time between two events. That's a difficulty for athletes there. But obviously disappointing. We couldn't secure Mika. Mika said he was about the legacy. So he wanted to be the youngest guy ever to double Grand Slam, which is basically win all the GI events, and win the ADCC that same year. My thoughts were, I'll, if I was in his position, and I never was obviously a prodigy, a talent like that, is I thought he had a position to make a statement in the sport, to kind of, as cheesy as it sounds, be on the right side of history. To have turned down a double Grand Slam to be in an event that supports athlete pay. Again, I don't overly criticize him, but I think in terms of your legacy and reputation, to be at a point and choose to do that is much more memorable than him getting that double grand slam, which I'm sure he will win the ADCC 77 kilo division this year, but it'll be somewhat tarnished anyway. So I, I do feel bad for some of the athletes that win this year and potentially people will be like, oh yeah, but there was half the people winning the division. I feel bad for those guys, but at the end of the day, most of these guys had an opportunity to be a part of an event that really there's no downside to. You have a chance to be paid more money than you've ever been paid in your life. You're selling tickets that are going to go to charity and it's not behind a paywall. So anyone anywhere in the world can stream this event, watch it, and there's no barrier to entry in terms of finances.